Well, hello, little kids. How are you today? My name is Eric Riley, and I'm a member of the UU, and I am going to continue the reading of A Christmas Carol that my two colleagues have just begun prior to today. Now, the last time you were with me, I think the ghost was about to appear. There was the clanking and rattling of chains, and they were heard by Scrooge, and he wasn't really sure what he was hearing. So now we're going to begin with the chapter that is Marley's Ghost. <laughs> the cellar door flew open with a booming sound, and then he heard the noise much louder on the floors below, then coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards his door. It's humbug still, said Scrooge. I won't believe it. His color changed, though when without a pause it came on through the heavy door and passed into the room before his eyes. Upon its coming in, the dying flame leaped up as though it cried, I know him, Marley's ghost, and fell again. The same face, the very same. Marley in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights, and boots. They wore that kind of thing back then. <laughs> the tassels on the ladder bristling like his pigtail and his coat skirts and the hair upon his head. The chain he drew was clasped about his middle. It was long and wound about him like a tail. And it was made, for Scrooge observed it closely, of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. His body was transparent, so that Scrooge, observing him and looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on his coat behind. Scrooge had often heard it said that Marley had no bowels, <laughs> but he had never believed it until now. No, nor did he believe it even now though he looked the phantom through and through and saw it standing before him, though he felt the chilling influence of its death-cold eyes and marked the very texture of the folded kerchief bound around his head and chin, which wrapper he had not observed before. He was still incredulous and fought against his senses. How now, said Scrooge, caustic and cold as ever, what do you want with me? Much, Marley's voice, no doubt about it. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then, said Scrooge, raising his voice. You're particular for a shade, he was going to say, to a shade, but substituted this as more appropriate. In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you, can you sit down, asked Scrooge, looking doubtfully at him. I can. Do it then. Scrooge asked the question because he didn't know whether a ghost so transparent might find himself in a condition to take a chair and felt that in the event of its being impossible, it might involve the necessity of an embarrassing explanation. But the ghost sat down on the opposite side of the fireplace, as if he were quite used to it. You don't believe in me, observed the ghost. I don't, said Scrooge. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? I don't know, said Scrooge. Why do you doubt your senses? Because, said Scrooge, a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheat. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragrant of an underdone potato. There's more gravy than grave about you, whatever you are. Scrooge was not much in the habit of cracking jokes, nor did he feel in his heart by any means waggish then. The truth is, that he tried to be smart as a means of distancing his own attention and keeping down his terror, for the specter's voice disturbed the very marrow in his bones. 
means to sit staring at those fixed glazed eyes in silence for a moment would play Scrooge felt the very deuce with him. There was something very awful too in the specter's being provided with an infernal atmosphere of its own. Scrooge would not feel it himself, but this was clearly the case. For though the ghost sat perfectly motionless, its hair and skirts and tassels still agitated as by the hot vapor from an oven. You see this toothpick, said Scrooge, returning quickly to the charge for the reason just assigned and wishing though it were only for a second to divert the vision's stony gaze from himself. I do, replied the ghost. You are not looking at it, said Scrooge, but I see it, said the ghost, notwithstanding. Well, returned Scrooge, I have but to swallow this and be for the rest of my days persecuted by a legion of goblins, all of my own creation. Humbug, I tell you, humbug. At this, the spirit raised the frightful cry and shook its chain with much such a dismal and appalling noise that Scrooge held on tight to his chair to save himself from falling in a swoon. But how much greater was his horror when the phantom, taking off the bandage around his head as if it were too warm to wear indoors, its lower jaw dropped down below his breast. Scrooge fell upon his knees and clasped his hand before his face. Mercy, he said, dreadful apparition. Why do you trouble me? Man of the worldly mind, replied the ghost. Do you believe in me or not? I do, said Scrooge. I must. But why do spirits walk the earth and why do they come to me? It is required of every man, the ghost returned, that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world. Oh, woe is me and witness what it cannot share, but might have shared on earth and turned to happiness. Again, the specter raised the cry and shook its chain and wrung its shadowy hands. You fettered, said Scrooge, trembling. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life, replied the ghost. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded it on my on of my own free will. And of my own free will, I wore it. Is its pattern strange to you? Scrooge trembled more and more. What would you know, pursued the ghost, the weight and the length of the strong coil you bear yourself? It was full as heavy and long as this seven Christmas Eves ago. You have labored on it since. It is a ponderous chain. Scrooge glanced about him on the floor in the expectation of finding himself surrounded by some 50 or 60 of fathoms of iron cable, but he could see nothing. Jacob, he said imploringly, old Jacob Marley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give, the ghost replied. It comes from other regions, Ebenezer Scrooge and is conveyed by other ministers to other kinds of men. Nor can I tell you what I would. A very little more is all permitted to me. I cannot walk beyond our counting house. Mark me. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house. Mark me. In life, my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole, and weary journeys lie before me. It was a habit with Scrooge whenever he became thoughtful to put his hand in his breeches pockets. Pondering on what the ghost had said, he did so now, but without lifting his eyes or getting off his knees. You remember he's on his knees. 
You must have been very slow about it, Jacob Scrooge observed, in a business-like manner, though with humility and deference. Slow, the ghost repeated. Seven years dead, mused Scrooge. And traveling all the time? The whole time, said the ghost. No rest, no peace, incessant torture of remorse. You travel fast, said Scrooge. On the wings of the wind, replied the ghost. You might have got over a great quantity of ground in seven years, said Scrooge. The ghost on hearing this set up another cry and clanked his chain so hideously in the dead silence of the night that the ward would have been justified in indicting it for a nuisance. Oh, captive bound and double ironed, cried the phantom, not to know that ages of incessant labor by immortal creatures for this earth must pass into eternity before the good of which is susceptible is all developed. Not to know that any Christian spirit, working kindly in its little sphere, whatever it may be, will find its moral life too short for its vast means of usefulness. Not to know that no space of regret can make amends for one's life's opportunities misused. Yet such was I, oh, such was I. But you were always a good man of business, Jacob, faltered Scrooge, who now began to apply this to himself. Business, cried the ghost, wringing his hands again. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. It held up its chain at arm's length as if it were the cause of all this unavailing grief and flung it heavily upon the ground again. At this time of the rolling year, he, the specter said, I suffer most. Why did I walk through crowds of fellow beings with my eyes turned down and never raise them to that blessed star which led the wise men to the poor adobe, abode? <laughs> that means house. Were there no, were there no poor homes in which this light would have conducted me? Scrooge was very much dismayed to hear the specter going on at this rate and began to quake exceedingly. Hear me, cried the ghost. My time is nearly gone. I will, said Scrooge, but don't be hard upon me. Don't be flowery, Jacob. Pray. How it is that I appear before you in a shape that you can see I may not tell. I have sat invisible beside you many and many a day. It was not my agreeable idea. Scrooge shivered and wiped the perspiration from his brow. That is no light part of my penance, pursued the ghost. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate. A chance and hope of my procuring Ebenezer. You were always a good friend to me, Scrooge. Thank ye. You will be haunted, resumed the ghost, by three spirits. Scrooge's countenance fell almost as low as the ghosts had done. Is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? He demanded in a faltering voice. It is. I, I think I'd rather not, said Scrooge. Without their visits, said the ghost, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. Couldn't I take them all at once and have it over, Jacob? Hinted Scrooge. Expect the second on the next night at the same hour. The third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to me no more. 
and look that for your own sake, you remember what has passed between us. When it had said these words, the specter took its wrapper from the table and bound it round his head as before. Scrooge knew this by the smart sound its teeth made when the jaws were brought together by the bandage. He ventured to raise his eyes again and found this supernatural visitor confronting him in an erect attitude with his chain wound over and about its arm. The apparition walked backward from him and at every step it took, the window raised itself a little so that when the specter reached it, it was wide open. It beckoned Scrooge to approach, which he did. When they were within two paces of each other, Marley's ghost held up its hand, warning him to come no nearer. Scrooge stopped. No, so much in obedience as in surprise and fear, for on the raising of the hand, he became sensible of confused noises in the air, incoherent sounds of lamentation and regret, wailings inexpressibly sorrowful and self-accusatory. The specter, after listening for a moment, joined in the mournful dirge and floated out upon the bleak, dark night. Scrooge followed to the window, a desperate, in his curiosity, he looked out. The air was filled with phantoms, wandering hither, thither, in restless haste and moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. Some few, they might be guilty governments, were linked together. None were free. Many had been personally known to Scrooge in their lives. He had been quite familiar with one old ghost, in a white waistcoat with a monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle, who cried piteously at being unable to assist a wretched woman with an infant whom it sat below upon a doorstep. The misery with them all was clearly that they sought to interfere for good in human matters and had lost the power forever. So you know that just means they're dead now so they can't help the living, except for these warnings, which is what Marley is giving to Scrooge. Whether these creatures faded into the mist or mist enshrouded them, he could not tell. But they and their spirit voices faded together, and the night became as it had been when he walked home. Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked as he had locked it with his own hands, and bolts were undisturbed. He tried to say humbug, but stopped at the first syllable. And being from the emotion he had undergone, or the fatigues of the day, or his glimpse of the invisible world, or the dull conversation of the ghost, or the lateness of the hour, much in need of repose, went straight to bed without undressing, and fell asleep upon the instant. <laughs> Nighty night, sweet ones. <laughs> <laughs>